Hi. <laughs> As Reverend Cantor mentioned, I've been away for a few weeks on paternity leave, and it was exactly one month ago today that my family welcomed in our second son named Micah. We named him after that verse uh, that, that Beth read, Reverend Dana read from the Hebrew Scriptures. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness or mercy, and walk humbly with your God? It's one of our favorite verses in our family, and we're hoping maybe he would represent a little of that hope during these times. I forgot a lot about what it meant to do this over again. <laughs> I considered titling this sermon, I'm so sleepy. <laughs> I'm so sleepy. Uh, Daniel suggested a diaper-based homily on Joseph. <laughs> And, and Beth uh, recommended a silent 20-minute meditation in which we all just close our eyes for God's sakes for a moment. Uh, which I might take her up on in just a minute. Uh, but I will say, uh, amid learning what a joy sleep is and what a hope it'll be someday, and remembering what it's like to wipe off, uh, spit up off your suit jacket before you come into the office in the morning, on my first day back with all of you, on this time coming into Advent and the Christmas decorations, I'm feeling the Christmas story a little easier this year with a newborn in the house. And that's a big deal for me because I can be a little cynical about this whole thing, to be honest with you. Um, as a minister, this is like our tax season. It's super busy, and there's a lot of to do making sure that Christmas happens for a lot of other people. Um, I go on my usual rant every year with my family about a holiday that's been overcome by godless consumerism and all of this thing. My family's so tired of that, of that rant. And so coming into this year, I'm feeling a little more receptive to the message that I think is, for me, really behind that story at all. And you all know as well as we do that when we approach religious texts and scriptures, we in this place, don't ask, is it true? We ask, what is true about the text? What is true about the story? What does it teach us about what it means to live a human life well and approach the mystery beyond all naming? And for me, I'm reading that story again, remembering that this story of Christmas time is a text thousands of years old that is about the most powerful, transformative, holy, life-changing moment these people experienced, showing up through human fragility and dependence. What on earth is more fragile and dependent and needy than a human mammal child? <laughs> A lot of other creatures are born and kind of just go their way. Sometimes their parents don't even do that part of the process with them. They're born and they just go along. But on the spectrum of I'm okay from birth to you can't leave me alone for long unless, or else I won't live, humans are on this side of the spectrum. The family that this story posits is a vulnerable fragile family in a vulnerable, fragile time. Every year around this time, we remind you, and it bears repeating, that this story is about unwed teenage parents, dark-skinned Middle Eastern Jews, likely a 13, maybe 15 or 16-year-old girl, poor, with no resources, who cross international borders without papers, that's what the text says, in a moment of crisis, who are left homeless and give birth in a dirty barn or a cave or a stable. How vulnerable must that 13-year-old girl 2,000 years ago be? No health care, no doula, no midwife, no OB, no essential oils or birthing ball, no classes on the Bradley method. We don't hear anything in the story of their family's assistance. Just that they're poor, tired, lonely, deadly afraid. And they have on their hands a new life that holds all the hope in the world for them. A life they know will be troubled and will one day end. The teacher that they give birth to goes up to be a homeless, illiterate rabbi. 
killed by the hands of the state for a crime he didn't commit. It's amazing, that story. And yet, the nativity scenes we drive by have an angelic, uh, lighter skinned than they probably should be family underneath plastic barns with still quiet animals and a halo over their heads. And any of you who have ever lived with a newborn know that it's nothing like that. <laughs> what we don't hear in the story is the infant savior spitting up and crying all night and tired parents changing diapers and wondering if they might hurt this tiny being. And that, even on the most traditional theological interpretation. If you were an orthodox, fundamentalist Christian, the interpretation would be that God was most known to human beings in that vulnerable, fragile form. These people who had longed, like the song this morning, for someone to come and make things right in a nation where everything felt like it was falling apart. Do you hear me on that one? <laughs> longing for somebody... They thought they were going to get this prince, a ruler, coming in to take over their political system. That was the dream of the, the Israelites at the time. And what they get is a baby who grows up to be a homeless teacher killed by the death penalty in an occupied empire. It's amazing. Now, the woman in the story that I read, I don't know if she was actually a Unitarian minister or not, but let's suppose she was would have left her Christmas services and traveled with her family, knowing well that she had just rehearsed a story about the mystery beyond all naming being known in a homeless family in a dirty barn. But that's not where we want to find our spiritual peace and progress, right? And so she overlooks it and keeps that at arm's distance, like I have done and will do a thousand more times to control and protect my family are what I deem to be valuable in my life. And probably like her, run out to the parking lot weeping, screaming, my God, my God, forgive me. It's tempting for us as Americans in this century, as Westerners, as Unitarian Universalists with our focus on reason and progress and human goodness, to believe that our spiritual lives follow a spreadsheet and a strategic plan and a budget or a capital campaign that we can lay down a nice color-coded Excel sheet on how we're going to be more generous, loving, graceful, forgiveness, forgiving, kind, or just. It's tempting to think we'll go to a one-day seminar and check off the box that says, okay, I've got forgiveness handled. Next year I'm working on justice, and after that maybe I'll throw in compassion. And that's not how it works at all. It's unlikely that any of my moments of spiritual enlightenment will happen alone in my office or at a retreat center. Oftentimes we learn about what it means to be human and approach the mystery beyond all naming in the moments of our lives that are frayed and fragile when we feel tired or anxious, scared, angry, upset. I've been so proud of this church so many times. And I've been proud of us making a good spreadsheet and putting on a good program. But I've been most proud of us when we were frightened. When we were tired. When we saw people among our midst or in the world who were suffering. And we said, that. That's what we're going to pay attention to. That is where we will learn what it means to be human. That tear in the fabric of our lives or in the world, that is what will teach us what it means to meet the holy. When we've done that, that's when I've been most proud of this place. And that, I think, is what the Christmas story is supposed to teach us. There are moments of grace and love and compassion, that our moments of meeting the holy in our lives are probably going to look more like frustration and tired families and being at our, our wit's end. I missed the last couple of weeks in church. I'm sure you've gone over the current climate. But boy, things feel fragile right now. Our political systems feel fragile. Our national values feel fragile. It feels like gains that have been made in the name of justice and equality feel fragile. Families feel fragile together. 
And none of that is new. That's territory that we as humans have gone over time and time and time again. In fact, the context out of that Micah piece, when it was written, have striking similarities to modern day challenges. That piece that we named our son after, Micah, that text, to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God, was written about 700 B.C. or before the Common Era, at least the first part of it. The latter part was probably written about four or 500 before the Common Era. If you go back and read it, it's amazing. It's one of the minor prophets, and people don't usually read anything but that one verse. But in the Hebrew Scriptures, the person who wrote that takes on the persona of the prophet Micah. And here are his complaints. We're living in a country that is divided politically. Family against family. Leader against leader. There's a conflict happening in Syria at the time. The Assyrian Empire has come and fought Israel. And there's a Syrian refugee crisis happening in the southern part of the kingdom. The residents of the southern part of the kingdom are afraid and scared. They're talking about the dangers of these refugees. The leadership of the country is lying to its people, and the gap between rich and poor is increasing. The prophet rails against corrupt politicians who spread lies, against people who treat the poor with disdain, and talks about the fear of its people. It's almost 3,000 years ago. And then in a moment of desperation, the person who's desperate in the text is actually their God, who says, what happened? What happened? I thought we had a deal. And so the prophet says, what do you want to do if you want to get in harmony with the divine? That phrase we use all the time. What, what should we do if we want to get back in right relationship with the mystery? We work our spreadsheet. Do we have the right views? Do we give to the right campaign? Do we, do we fund the right people? Do we vote the right way? Do we go to the right church? Do I make the right sacrifice? And the answer that the prophet gives is do justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. We're pretty good at doing justice. Loving kindness. Not just doing kindness, but loving it. That's a real hard one. And walking humbly with my God, that's a really hard one. Having a deeply held conviction, a mystery that calls my life forward, telling me this, this is what you're called to do and be, and yet you have to do it with humility, that's, that's really hard. But that's the answer that this particular person in a divided country with a Syrian refugee crisis, with a growing gap between the rich and poor, with the worry that politicians don't care for the most vulnerable among us, that's the answer that they give. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. It feels a little bit to me like we are still in that Christmas story. People that are more fragile than we would like to admit living in a world that is more fragile than we would like to admit, that is beyond our control, whether we admit it or not, that is beyond our comprehension. My guess is that the cast of characters aren't going away. The tired, homeless family, the greedy innkeeper, the tax collectors, the greedy and corrupt politicians, this cast of characters is not going away anytime soon, and we will play all of the roles at some point. My guess is that our spiritual enlightenment in the Christmas season will not suddenly come to us in a vision where everything is neat and tidy and the baby stops crying and sleeps through the night. My guess is it's going to stay messy for a while. And so we must ask ourselves, what kind of people do we wish to be no matter what? No matter who's in charge, no matter where we, whether we feel like we're winning or not, whether the nation is healed again, what kind of people will we become, no matter what? 
I can think of no day where we will not be called to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. I, think, I can think of no time when it won't do us good to pay attention to the parts of our lives that feel fragile, frayed, to the parts of ourselves that feel anxious or tired or scared because that is where we will connect with the needs of our fellow humans, with the mystery beyond all naming that calls us to repair the world. And so in this season in which the darkest days of the year are coming, I hope that we choose justice, kindness, and humility with the mystery that changes our lives. May it be so. Amen.